So over the last uh, few weeks, we have been in our series, uh, Give More. And today, we're going to talk Give More Thanks. And it may seem like an obvious thing to talk about because Thanksgiving is, you know, in a few days. But I want to ask you, what are you thankful for? <laughs> Gretchen just stole it all. She's thankful for it all. <laughs> Anyone else? What are, you, what are you thankful for? Jesus? Renee is thankful for her Nutella? Yes, thankful for joy, presence. What else are you, what else are you thankful for? You thankful for your husband? Come on. Yeah? What else? I'm th I'm, I am thankful for my boss. I am thankful for my boss. I'm thankful that my boss will be in the office this week because sometimes it gets lonely in there. <laughs> oh, sometimes we just we have people going all over the place and the office is a little lonely. I'm thankful for friends. <laughs> well, think more on what you're thankful for because I may come back to you because this shouldn't be that difficult for us to be like, you know what, I'm thankful for my house. I'm thankful that I have a car. I'm thankful that I was able to put gas in the car this week, you know. Um, I'm thankful for my church family. I'm thankful for where I live. I'm thankful for California. I'm thankful for America. I'm thankful for the call of God on my life. I'm thankful for my church family. You're my family. You're friends that I've chosen to be my family. I, uh, I took to Google this week. Uh, to find some things that children are thankful for. And I want to share some of those with you. Some of the things that kids are thankful for, this one came up a few times, toilet paper. And then the comment was, it is helpful. <laughs> another, another, another child said, my baby brother, because, uh, but what I asked for was a puppy but I'm still thankful for my brother. This, this kid wrote, and it was in order, one, two, and three. Number one, Netflix. Number two, mummy. And number three, daddy. This child's got the priorities down. Someone else was thankful for bubble wrap. Can I get an amen on the bubble wrap? I mean, how many people, you get the bubble wrap out of the Amazon, even if it's the big puffy air thing, and you pop that. Every, every time, there's just some joy in bubble wrap. This other child lacks no, uh, uh, there's no end to their self-confidence because they were thankful for me. That's, they just simply wrote, I'm thankful for me. Someone else wrote, I'm thankful for ceiling fans. In 110 degree weather, who's not thankful for a ceiling fan? This one, um, I'm thankful for corn because you can see it in your poop. I'm thankful my brother isn't a monster because if he was a monster, he would eat me. <laughs> this child says, I'm thankful for shoes, for getting new shoes, and for people who make shoes. They like shoes. Snowmen, daddy, and quesadillas. Come on, can we get an amen for quesadillas? <laughs> I am thankful that I got to see a cow poop. I am thankful for sparkles and glitter. No. <laughs> this one. There's going to be somewhat of a reoccurring theme, and I'll wrap this up here, but <laughs> I'm thankful for my mommy who wipes my poop. This is a good thing to be thankful Then the, the last one. I am thankful for pants. I am also thankful for pants because it makes conversations with people so much less awkward Thank you, Jesus, for giving us pants, because there is no shortage of things to be thankful for this season. So as we, as we talk, give more thanks. You know, I don't know about you, but I personally, I say thanks a lot. <laughs> My son, yeah. Was that, was, oh, I thought that was you. <laughs> to be honest, every time I say thanks, I don't always mean it. I just know it's the polite thing to do. So, you know, like the Amazon guy comes up the front steps and he gives me the package. I say, thanks. And, and, and sometimes I say, thanks. And I haven't even begun to process exactly what I'm saying thanks for. Someone will hold the door open. Thanks. 
You know, you, you, you coffee from, from, from the barista, thanks. Someone cuts you off in traffic, thanks. <laughs> saying thanks is the, is the polite, it's the social thing to do. It's almost like saying bless you after you've sneezed. But really, when we say thanks like that, it's just thanks. Thanks, thanks for that. I need a pen. Thanks. Thanks for that. Is there any, really any meaning behind our thanks? So when I talk today, giving more thanks, it's not about saying thanks more, but it's about deeply and meaningfully connecting with God through thanks. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles 16. It's where we find the story of David, David, who is establishing what we now know as David's tent. It's the tent where he brings the Ark of the Covenant in and he establishes worship 24 hours a day, seven days a week that goes on for decades. In the, in the portion of scripture that we are going to read, he's giving the instruction to the Levites. And it reads, starting in, in, in verse number one, and they brought in the Ark of God and placed it inside the tent which David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord, and he distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread and a portion of meat and a raisin cake. That is a lot of bread, meat, and raisin cakes. There are millions of people in Israel, and he gave every man and woman one of those. And it says, he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. There are three specific instructions that David gives to the, to the Levites that they were to do. They were to, number one, celebrate. Number two, thank. And number three, praise. So we're going to look at these three things, these three things that David told the Levites to celebrate. Celebrate literally means to remember. It means to recall, to call to mind, to make a memorial, to think on. It is the Hebrew word zakar, and it is translated as celebrate because that's the result of remembering what God has done in your life. It turns it to celebration. This is about the past deeds, the things that God has already done and accomplished in your life. We cannot ever be those people who forget the things that God has done for us. We must continually bring them up to our mind. We must recall them. We must remember them so that we can live in this continual atmosphere of faith built on what God has already done. See, if God did that in my life so many years ago, then I know that he can get me through this. So when you're facing trials and struggles and things that come against you and things that, that pop up and, they, and they, 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 they sideswipe you, you mean, God got me through that. I know he can get me through this. I need a miracle in my life. Well, God, God performed that miracle in my life. I, I, I know he will do this. But if we don't remember and if we don't take the time to actively recall and think about the goodness of God poured out on our lives, then we are in danger of forgetting God. Now, now maybe you won't forget God because God did those things in your life. But what about the generation that's coming up behind you that you are influencing, that you are leading, that you are raising up? Judges chapter 2 verses 7 through 11 says, The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Then Joshua, son of Nun, servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the territory and inher of his inheritance, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then... Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Now think about the things that God had done for that Joshua generation and his generation. When they finally crossed over into the promised land, 
That's, that's the first thing. They crossed into the promised land. They inhabited, they took possession of the land that was promised to them hundreds of years before. And they took possession of it. Not only did they cross over into the promised land to take possession of it, but they crossed over on dry ground. God stopped the Jordan from flowing, and it says it's stacked up in a heap upriver, and they crossed over on dry ground. They came to Jericho, who had these, these enormous walls. It was a fortress, impenetrable. And the walls fell flat because they walked around it and they shouted at the walls. The sun, there was another battle that they were fighting. And Joshua and, and his army was, was, was in, the, in, in the throes of battle. And the sun started going down. And they thought, they, they were concerned that they would have to redo this battle again. Because as the sun goes down, the battle, battle would stop. And Joshua prayed, God, make the sun stand still. And the sun stood still in the sky so they could finish the battle. And there was a great victory. And it says, never again has God done that, made the sun stand still in the sky. There were times in, 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 in battle as they, were, as they were taking possession of the promised land that God entered in and helped them in the battle. And there's one instance where it says that he threw hailstones down from heaven upon the enemy. So Joshua and the, and the nation watched God defeat enemies before them. There were armies that were so great, they were described as the sands of the seashore, and not one enemy was ever able to stand against Joshua and that generation. Now, these are the things, these are incredible things that God had done, but yet the generation immediately after them did not know the Lord. They did not know the things that he had done for them. Because they failed to remember the very next generation didn't know the Lord or what he had done. And then they did evil in the sight of the Lord and they served other gods. See, when God does something in our lives, it's never just for us. It's for other people too. Revelation 19.10, we know it well. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See, when the ge next generation, those that you are influencing, those that you are, you, are, you are leading, those that you are raising up, when they hear the stories of what God has done in your life, it prophesies to them that God can do the same thing in their life. It prophesies to them that God is real, that he does supernatural, miraculous things. That he's not just some distant, far-off God who started the universe and then stepped back and said, oh, let's just see how this plays out. But he is active and he is involved and he is present. God, forgive us for not sharing the stories of your goodness, of your miracles that you have done for us. Because we cause the next generation to stumble and be led astray by withholding our remembrance. Let's not be those people that forget to remember and fail to celebrate what God has done. We, it is our job to set the next generation up. To go further in the kingdom of God than what we have gone. To experience more of God than what we have experienced. We have to set them up, so, so, so to speak, that, that our ceiling is their floor. But we can't do that if we're not sharing the stories of what God has done. And I, to be honest, I, I stand before you and admittedly, chances are I've forgotten more, most, more of things that God has done than what I remember. There's two things that I do to try and help me remember what God has done. The first one is I write it down. I try and, I, I, I keep a prayer journal of things that I'm praying for. And I, and I write in it in two different color pens, a black one and a red one. And, and all my prayers I write, I write down in black. And I'll sit before the Lord and I'll, date, I'll write the date down and I'll just write down the things that I'm praying for. And then I've got a red pen for every time that God answers a prayer because I go back and I find it on the date that I asked for it, that I was praying about it, and I write down what God did and then I date that. So I've got this book that I can go back and I can see, look at what God has done. Look at the prayers that he has answered because sometimes we forget that we ask God to do that and next thing you know, we, we have provision or we've got breakthrough or whatever the case might be and we're not even connecting the fact that we prayed for that. 
There's, there's also, time, well, here, this, this goes with number two. We talk about it. As a family, we will sit down. We, we, we make it a priority to eat together. Now, as, as you know, those of you who have older kids, you know, as the kids get older and they've got things going on, it gets harder to, to eat meals together. But we do our very best, and especially on Saturday mornings, we, we almost guard that uh, religiously so that we can sit and eat breakfast together. And when we sit and eat breakfast together, there's, there's many things that we do. But we talk and we'll pray. And, and, and some of the things that we do is we talk about the things that God has done for our family. The things that we have prayed for. And there have been times when we have connected the things that God has done back to a prayer that we have prayed. Do you remember when we prayed this? Now look at what God has done. So we don't let those things die. And sometimes it's just so good to sit around and to talk about the miracles and the breakthroughs that God has done in our lives. We give more thanks by celebrating what God has done. Second instruction that David gave to the Levites was this, thank. Thank God, which seems to be a, a pretty uh, straightforward and obvious, but I personally like like to be Captain Obvious. That's, that might be my superpower, Captain Obvious. You can ask the staff, there's times when we'll sit around in, in staff meeting, we're talking about something, and, and, I'll, and I'll say, now this might be obvious, but, and I'll just, I'll state the obvious, because I like when the obvious is stated because it brings clarity. That way we all know we're all on the same page. We know that we're all talking about the same thing, or, or maybe it's just me. Now I know I'm on the same page as everybody else, and, and I'm not misunderstanding. The Hebrew word here is yada, which means to revere or worship with extended hands. See, we give more thanks to God when we engage in act of worship of God. The, the implication here is not, not giving thanks for what God has done, but giving thanks for who God is. When we give thanks for who God is, really, that's the basis, that's the bedrock of our worship. Verse 7, go, it, 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 David goes on and it says this, back in 1 Chronicles 16, it says, Then on that day, David first entrusted to Asaph and his relative to give thanks to the Lord, and the Amplified adds this, as their chief task. The Levites, the worship leaders, their primary task before the ark of God in the presence of God was to give thanks for who God is. This was above and before celebrating all the things that God had done for them and remembering and recalling them. This is before expressing our feelings of love and of adoration for Him. See, worship is about God and it's for God. It's to God before it's anything else. It doesn't mean that, we, that in the midst of worship that we're not giving thanks for what He's done. And it doesn't mean in the midst of worship we're not expressing our love and our adoration for Him. But outside of our love and, and, and adoration and the things that He's done for us, He's still God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And He is sitting on the throne. We worship Him for who He is. Brad Coring, who's a, a Hillsong pastor and, and a worship leader, says this, a mystery of worship is that it isn't about us, but about God. But God doesn't need our worship, we do. We need to worship God. He doesn't need it. The moment we, and sometimes it's, it's like a slip of the tongue or maybe something that we say, but we're like, oh, God needs, you can just stop. God needs nothing. He doesn't need my worship. He doesn't need me to do anything. God is God. He's good all on his own. He wants to partner with me. He wants us to experience him in worship. We need to worship. We are compelled to worship. We are driven to worship God because he is worthy. And when we have a revelation of his worth that just explodes out of us, we overflow in giving more thanks for who he is. And so when we talk about who God is, what we're talking about is his characteristics. What we're talking about is his attributes, those things of God that make God God. Now this, and I think, I've, yeah, I've, so I've got a list of just some of the attributes of God. God is eternal. He is mercy. He is gracious. He is imminence, which means that God is intimately involved in our lives. He's not that distant God. He is omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful. 
He's omnipresent. He is righteous, holy, good. He is immutable, which means he is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is self-existent. He is just. He is sovereign. He is love. And he is transcendent, which means that God is unlike any other. There is no analogy. There is no comparison. There is no simile or metaphor that you can make to accurately and perfectly describe who God is. He is indescribable. And all of these things are rooted in Scripture. They're not rooted in our thoughts. They're not rooted in our feelings. Renee talked about last week about the importance of being rooted in the Word. Because when you're in the Word, it should lead us to worship. Let me give you another, another example of, 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 of worshiping God for who He is. See, when we love God, praise for who He is should follow I'm going to give you some statements and some, some scripture references. I don't think I put these on the screen. We praise him for his power, Psalms 147 and verse 5. Truth, John 17, 17. Forgiveness, Ephesians 4, 23. Creativity, Genesis 127. Capability, Ephesians 3, 20. Praise for the fact that he is sovereign, Colossians 1, 17. He is gracious, Psalms 116, verse 5. Merciful, Luke 6, 36. Compassionate, Psalms 145, verses 8 through 9. Loving, Psalms 136, verse 26. We praise him that he heals, 1 Peter 2, 24 that he saves Ephesians 2 8 that he protects Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6 that he leads Isaiah 30 and verse 21 that he strengthens Isaiah 41 and 10 these are just some of the things that God is some of the things that we can praise him for for who he is give more thanks it sets the trajectory of our lives up towards him See, when we engage in worship and we give thanks for who he is, it takes our eyes off of us and off of our situation and off of our surroundings and off of our feelings. And it, it, it just, it anchors everything in truth and our, our eyes lift up and we, our trajectory is towards God. It's not straightforward and it's not down and it's not inward. We need to lift our eyes up. Keep your eyes on him. Give more thanks for who who he is. And the third instruction that, that David gave to the Levites was praise. And this is the Hebrew word halal, which means to shine or to make a show, to boast. It means to rave. We didn't realize that this is the original rave party. It's true. We'll get a little bit more into it. It means to celebrate, give life, or to act madly like a madman. Now ask yourself, just in inwardly, don't answer out loud, when was the last time that I gave praise to God and I acted like a madman? This, though, this is biblical praise. So I want us to think about, like we, we started by reading uh, 1 Chronicles 16 verses, verses 1 through 7, 1 through 4, somewhere in there. Um, and that's when the, the, the ark was put into the tent and we, we read that. That, uh, that, that account. Just before that, there's an incredible scene that takes place as the ark is traveling and making its way into Jerusalem. And I, wanna, I want us to think about that for a minute when we think about praise. See, there is this huge procession of singers and musicians and all the people were shouting and celebrating. It says that every six steps they sacrificed an animal in worship. Every... We just, need to, you just, we just need to think about that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sacrifice an animal. Stop. We're, we're do, this is what we're doing. Which can't be a short process. Six more steps. Sacrifice. An, this, this is costly worship. See, worship should cost us something. It says that David wore a linen ephod. Now, this is not what a king would wear. This is not regular king, king robes. This was something, as I dug into this, that it says that, that a child would wear who is entering into the service of, of, of priesthood. So this is the, the lowest um, garment that, that a priest would, would, would wear. This is servant's garment. David wasn't there as king. Look at me, regal and royal. He was there serving before the presence of the Lord. 
See, this, what was taking place was all, was all for God. It had nothing to do with him. That's why he took his kingly robes off and said, God, this is all for you. And then it goes on and it goes on to say that David began to dance before the Lord with all his might. That, that he was dancing like a madman. And literally what, that what it means is he was spinning and springing around in circles. And I've debated whether or not that I should try and imitate this. And I've gone with the side of no. Because chances are I would fall off the stage. And th then I would need help, someone to help stand me up so I could finish the message. But I, I, I looked, at, I looked some, for some videos to, to see, like, what is trying to wrap my mind around what this exactly looked like. And there's, there's, there's videos of, 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 obviously not David, people portraying David, and he was bouncing and spinning around and around and around, and he was making his way through the city up towards where, where the tent, where they were going to put the, 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 the ark. And he was dancing with all of his might, and you can just imagine in the heat of the day, in the sweat, and he's just, he's just going for it. He is undone before God. He wasn't jumping, and you know, like what we do, that, that, that's how we dance, or you know, some of us are a little bit more, and he wasn't grooving. I mean, I know I've watched some people dance and worship, and they just groove in. They're, they're feeling it. They're not doing any of, he wasn't doing any of those things. He was dancing like a crazy man. People watched him being like, the king's a crazy man. In fact, it was such a sight that his wife compared him to a foolish one that uncovers himself or reveals his nakedness. Now, he was not naked, but that was the comparison. Oh, how the king has disrobed himself and made himself like a foolish one, one who uncovers himself before the servants, the, the peasants. That was her comparison of David. The king should never act like that. See, David, in this scene, he embodied halal praise in this moment. He made a show for God. He was raving and shining lights on God and acting like a madman. See, when we say praise, that's not the image that we get. Because we obviously don't speak the Hebrew that they spoke. So when we say praise, our definition and what we think of isn't anchored in, in the Hebrew text. Ours is anchored in the Latin. And it really, praise is defined as, as admiration. Coming from the Latin root word meaning price or to attach value to. Which isn't, there's nothing wrong with that because he is worthy. Right? So that's, that's, the, that's the, 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 the mindset that we have when we say praise. He is worthy. We, there's, there's admonition. There's value. There's, there's worth attached to him. He's priceless. But David is raving like a madman dancing before the Lord with all of his might. He is praising. He is halal praising. Biblical halal praise of God flows out of the first two instructions that David gave to the Levites, remembering what God has done, thanking God for who he is, and it causes this explosion of praise inside of us that we can't keep in, that we can't keep a lid on. See, give more thanks leads us to expressions of worship that people don't understand. And that's okay. It's okay for, not to, for them not to understand because it's not for them and it's not about them. See, there's nothing wrong with becoming undone in the presence of God. Setting aside all of your dignity and self-respect and, and all of those things that we like to have. See, we like to come into the house of God and, and try and keep it together. Try and look like we're sane, normal people, especially for the guests. But when it just explodes out of us, we set aside all the self-respect. We set aside all that, all the self-stuff because it's not about self. It's all about Him. And it, I'm telling you, it's okay to become undone in the presence of God. It's okay to make yourself look foolish in front of people all for God. Well, some might say, well, that's fleshly worship and worship must be in the Spirit. They're right. It is worship in the flesh because we're covered in flesh. And the spirit on the inside of me is commanding my flesh to worship God. So of course your worship's going to be in the flesh. I think we spend maybe just a little too much time trying to determine if that's flesh or if that's spirit. Or You know what? You're wrapped in flesh. It's going to be flesh. And if we get it wrong, man, we're erring on the side of being excited for Jesus. 
And I never want to, you know, what? You, Sister Womack, you're a little bit too excited. <laughs> Trying to dial that down a little bit. Right? It's so much easier to give guidance and direction than it is to light a fire underneath someone and get them excited. Let's just go ahead and be excited before God. Right? Like, like for real, when you come into worship, maybe we need to come in with, with a different mindset. Eyes not on us, eyes on him. It's all about him, it's all for him. Go ahead, get a little crazy. Right, go ahead, get a little crazy in worship. Because that's the definition, act like a madman. Go ahead, get a little crazy, right? And I, and I know, and we, we can look around at, at the times that we're not in church, not in worship, not in that reverent atmosphere. You know, when we're watching the basketball game or we're cheering on our kids at some kind of competition, and yes, you look like a crazy person. You know, you're a crazy soccer mom, and you are a crazy football dad. You are that person that everyone's looking at being like, wow, you just need to simmer down there a little bit, right? It's okay there. This is more okay here. I think you just need to know it's okay. It's okay. Give more thanks is a call to push into expressions of worship that are uncomfortable for us and that are new to us because its roots are found in him and not in us. Give more thanks is not about saying thank you more. It's about deeply and meaningful, meaningfully connecting with God through thanks for what he's done. Celebrate. Who he is, thanks, which leads to an explosion of halal praise. Give more thanks. Give more thanks. Thank you. Father, I pray that you would take your word and you would um, drive it like a nail deep into our spirits. That you would change us with your word. Your word has the power to change and transform us. That you would unlock in us those expressions of worship that we have been in the past afraid to engage in. That our eyes would be on you. That we would become undone in your presence. That we would remember the things that you have done in our lives. That we would not forget. We would talk about it. We would write it down. We would share it. And that we would give thanks for who you are. You, you, you are awesome, God. You are awesome. I know there's more to give. I've got more to give. I can give more thanks. So Holy Spirit, guide us, lead us, draw us, woo us into those places of give more thanks. In Jesus' name.